it's Vader time. <laughs> Vader in Japan time, actually. So we're going to talk about Vader, Big Van Vader, Super Vader, um, Baby Bull, uh, Leon White. Uh, passed away three years ago, but holy moly, did he make an impact on Japanese pro wrestling and pro wrestling around the world. But uh, his, the I was watching more of his matches and reading about his career more and more prepping for this segment. And um, I can't think of too many people in the wrestling industry who he had a different level of success. It was, it was really worldwide in, in a way that we'll never probably experience again, because he was one of the last people I got, I mean, maybe Brock Lesnar is maybe the next person, but he was floating between, two or three of the biggest promotions in the world in the nineties between WCW, New Japan and EWFI. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made and he made it. So uh, not just that, but in the ring, I don't know who else wrestled like this guy before or since. So, okay. JD general thoughts on Vader. Cause we all kind of grew up watching him WCW. When you think Vader, what comes to mind? What the first thing that comes to mind is can you believe this man started wrestling at 30? Like he was 30 when he started. Like that's just mind boggling to me. But he's one of those athletic freaks. You I know, know. He, was, he was in the Rams, right? Yeah. And so and watching them some of his early matches, what we'll talk about in a little bit. Watching some of his early matches, that's where his charisma comes from. He just when you look at it, go, oh man, he's just like an amped up football dude. Mm-hmm. He's just a big jock who's insanely but, athletic. But he transposed that into pro uh, wrestling and it worked like fucking, excuse me, like gangbusters like, because, uh, yeah, it was, it was him, but nobody who was like him. No, it's really like, hard to, I, I guess Bigelow would be the one I could think would be the closest to him. But I mean, like yeah. he's still on another level. Like for me, like what I really fell in love with Vader was that, uh, that first Cactus Jack feud with Mick Foley. Cause those, that as, when I first got into WCW, that was one of the things that, that really made me feel like, okay, this this promotion is really different than WWF. Like, there was just something to that whole thing that I really, like, took to. And um, 1993, for me, will always be the year of Big Van Vader. Because that was the year, I was the first full year I followed WCW. And, like, it was Vader. It was Vader everywhere. And, like, it was... And I'll still that that Starcade match is still the, the best single match I think that was ever booked in the in the Eric Bischoff era as far as just like one the booking of one specific match you know and everything just just clicked and man that's just the American stuff I learned about him like going on and and to really look at like where he was really good in Japan it's just you know it's hard it's hard to get the the WWF stink off him but I think that when you ignore that you really have one of the all time greats. And I don't, I don't think that's an over exaggeration. I, I think we're still kind of like, we have to see where he'll sit in the continuum. I think we just need a couple more years away. Cause he, he just passed. Mm-hmm. It wasn't too long ago, but John, when you think of Vader in Japan, um, what are your highlights when you, cause I mean, there's Vader and WCW. We think of certain things. We think of flair and staying WWF. We think of the poor run that JD was just talking about. But when you think Japan, he, he had maybe three, three main avenues of four main avenues of serious success. Yeah. That that's, that's his, that's where he was featured. I think the best well, obviously, obviously WCW, but he was really treated really well there. But like, I mean, I mean, they put a rocket on him and Noki, got killed you know got destroyed like no one's really seen that happen before and here he you know it was supposed to be what sid vicious right was supposed to be the big van vader gimmick if i remember correctly. ultimate warrior oh ultimate warrior that's right it's that's right. right jim helwig yeah. yes thank god that didn't happen <laughs> and um imagine right. how the like that the butterfly effect that might have had on pro wrestling man well i well i what would happen it was the big van vader game it wouldn't last long i bet you anything in oki was said, screw i'm just gonna just sub this guy and be done with it after he got in the ring with jim Helwig, you know um but no he you know he put the rocket right on vader and and he's to me he's if not the greatest or one of the greatest big man in, in wrestling history i mean he's such a sensational athlete 
you know, for his size. And uh, when I first saw him, of course, it was WCW, and and I kind of tweeted out that that teaser clip because that's that first video I saw of him. I never, I don't even think I even recognized his name in magazines, or I wasn't really paying close attention. And when they announced it coming to WCW, and they, I saw that video. Yeah, so when I saw Vader, that little VTR of his coming to WCW at the Clash Champions 11, I rewatched that thing. I love that music. That da, na, na, na. Like, I just, I just, I remember as a kid, I just kept rewinding and rewinding it. And when I first saw him at the Bash 90, I was a little disappointed because, like, you know, as a kid, you used to the big jacked up muscle guys. And then when I saw him, like, I thought he was, oh, this little brown guy, but he had this, this cool mask and he was so physical and I became a fan. But in Japan, I like, go through the history, like, man, what a great wrestler he was. Like, he really understood when to do the stuff in the ring as a big man. Um, people had to earn it with him, but he's also so giving at the same time. But when it mattered, like, I just recently watched um, his match with Fujinami. It's on New Japan World. It's from 89, June of 89, I believe it was the date. And they had, like, the probably one of the best big man little bit little heavyweight man match i guess you want to say it was just brilliant and um you know he was sensational and you know i think you know people have bam bam bigelow like a lot of people love him because i love bam bam bigelow as well but vader is just a step ahead of him because all the success and the title runs uh in new japan and the big matches that he drew with you know inoki fujinami hashimoto etc um he's tremendous and um he's definitely an all-time great so let's get right into it for i'm going to start from so vader at this point in his career this is around 87 88 and john you mentioned the match with inoki that was so important in his career so let's kind of go to that point in his career so he's in cwa the catch wrestling association that auto ones um they it, based in uh, austria germany uh, during that time when he was there, there were uh, Shin Hashimoto was also there. Um, Kendo Sasaki or Kensuke Sasaki was wrestling there at the time too. I think uh, Masa Saito was also there. Um, and that connection was all through the AWA connection in Minnesota where Vader trained with Brad Renigans, I believe. Mm -hmm. But So there's that whole connection. You kind of see from Minnesota to Europe – and from Europe to Japan. So like we were saying, there was this gimmick that was prepared to kind of take out Inoki. It was 1988. Uh, it was supposed to be Jim Hel <clears throat> excuse me, Jim Helwig or Ultimate Warrior. And it wasn't. Yeah. So <laughs> that's we'll have to kind of do some fantasy booking on that sometime. Uh -huh. But uh, so it's Vader. And this Vader character is based on like Japanese folklore, right? It, I don't know the exact story or where it's from, but it's supposedly something like this uh, legendary character, this monster character who kind of fought off enemies for like two days uh, and defended his city or something like that. I, I could be completely getting it wrong. I don't know all the details on that, but it's loosely based on something from Japanese folklore. And I think that might have influenced the design of the what would he say? Like the helmet slash shoulder pad contraption that blew smoke. What do you actually call that? I just call it his helmet, right? Yeah, his helmet. A monstrosity. I'm still, That's still wicked. <laughs> I'm still, I think I figured out how the smoke came out. I think there's someone that has the controller on the side that when he does his little hand gesture, they click a button. I that think. makes sense. Yeah, because it was always on time. Yeah. yeah, except if you go search it out, it's Vader, Maglito Perez, and TNT, which is you know Savia Vega versus Muto, um, uh, Kendo Kimura, and Tatsumi Fujinami. And Vader does the you know does the whole his whole presentation, the mask, and he's called for the smoke, and it doesn't go on, <laughs> and the whole crowd just laughs, and he starts he starts patting it, touching it, kicks it down, kicks it around. <laughs> Then puts uh, it back up, and then he does it again, and then it goes off, and the whole crate go place goes nuts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had to learn all of this main event stuff on the fly. He was forced into this position because, you know, it was who he is, stature, uh, his size. But uh, 
I think by the time he was in Japan, he this is where he kind of learned how to be Vader to me. That's what I saw. And it, he was forced into it because he was put into a position where he put over Antonio Inoki, the president of the company, and who hadn't lost a match in seven years up to that point. So they're in Sumo Hall. It's uh, 1988. Earlier in the night, Antonio Inoki beat Riki Choshu, who was peaking still, probably at one of the most one of the most popular wrestlers in the country at the time still. 88. He beats Toshu earlier. Vader comes out to challenge uh, Inoki as a part of a uh, director and actor and comedian beat Takeshi, Takeshi Kitano. He was a part of, Vader was a part of his uh, kind of Kitano, or what is it? Takeshi, like pro wrestling gun done, like group or gang. He was going to have a gang. He was a celebrity. He's a huge celebrity. He still is a huge celebrity. Like, it was a huge, huge get. I can't... It's like if WWF got Robert De Niro to be a part of... I, I don't even know if that's an apt uh, comparison. I don't know who's like him, but this guy beat Takeshi. He's really, really popular, okay? And he came in at the Sumo Hall show, and Vader is who they bring out, and he beats Inoki in four minutes. A little over four minutes, and people lose it. Total, total destruction. And he beat him with a power slam, like a jumping power slam. And it has been so much fun rewatching his old matches from that point when he beats Inoki. Every time he hits that power slam in a match, the people react big because they know that's the move that he finished off Antonio Inoki with their, you know, their hero. You know, so it was, it's a, it's a, it's a great watch, like. You know, yeah, it's a squash match, but like just to hear the crowd reaction, it wasn't like Ivan Koloff beating Bruno San Martino and the whole place went silent. It was like just they went they went ballistic <laughs> when that happened. We were talking we were talking earlier, Justin, mm-hmm. about B Takeshi about uh B Takeshi. And like he like you mentioned him being a star when he was in the early two thousands, his work was being sold to the US and they were promoting him like the Japanese Quentin Tarantino. Right. That's right. And like this, he was a big, I said, I wrote a paper, I wrote a paper on his films back in college. Like this dude was legit. Like this is a huge get for new Japan. Like this is like you said, Robert, not uh, Robert De Niro or, or like Quentin Tarantino or someone that major coming in to have his own like faction there. That the, that the like, think about that's craziness for years. He was, so I worked at a, a big English company, an English conversation company. It was like a corporation, right? They had all they had a couple hundred schools all over the country. Uh, the one that I worked for had this one famous actress as their spokesperson and a, a kind of big rival that was more based out of Canada. They were called ECC. The spokesperson was this guy, Bitsukeshi. So I, w- actually, if you watch any Tokyo Dome matches, you'll see a big sign sometimes in the shot says ECC. That's an like English company. And Kitano was... I don't know if he still is, but for years, and when I was there, he was a spokesperson, which means you see his face everywhere. You see his face on subways and buses and TV, on coffee cans. So I, I need to still express the magnitude of how popular this guy was. A legitimate star. But what happened was because of the kind of small-scale riot that broke out after the match, it was a disaster. New Japan got banned from using Sumo Hall until next February in 89. And it really apparently soured Kitano's uh, uh, interest in pro wrestling at the time. And he, he pulled out and I don't think he ever really did worked with pro wrestling in a serious manner ever since then. So that's kind of uh, it's what it is, but it could have been a lot bigger, even though it was pretty big in retrospect. I think, there's a possibility this could have been like out of this world big with Kitano, but he never uh, attached himself to it. So Vader went on to develop on his own and he was just fine in the wrestling context. So he beats Inoki and then he also wins in the main event at the first pro wrestling show at Tokyo Dome in 89. And he was the first foreign IWGP heavyweight champion. Look at that. Yeah, he was in the tournament uh, early like 89. He beat who was it? Uh, Hashimoto, 
but uh, but he lost his choke. Oh, excuse me, yeah, he lost lost the Hashimikov. He lost the title. Yeah, he was he, he eventually lost the title to Hashimikov. And who, um, JD? How do you interpret Hashimikov? And did you see his match? I did. Vader? I, I watched it for the paper for the thing at paper. Uh, I'm in college. I, I for the article I just wrote. I made sure to watch that match. Um, how do I interpret it? That's Enochiism before Enochiism, because Hashimikov was the most. Um, he was the most storied of the Russians that came in. He's a legitimate four-time world champion, but he, uh, he, he never won the Olympics. He probably would have won it in 84 when Baumgartner wins it, but that was the, the Los Angeles games that the Soviets blocked. So it's classic Inoki. This is the guy, you know, he's got the background match. Isn't great. Like he hits one of the worst arm spins I've ever seen in my life on Vader. Like, oh my God. It's terrible. Like as a, as an amateur wrestler, part of me died, but, um, you know, it is, I get it. It's pure Anoki. Like put the title on the legit, on the legit guy. But in a wrestling, a pro wrestling context, I mean, I, the concept of selling was just not with him. He was, no, he, he was, it, it was like the classic do a move, get up, look confused, wait for the next thing to happen. And to be fair, he's got six months, four months of, of, of pro wrestling training at this point. And he's passed his prime as an amateur competitor. So, I mean, like you, you legitimately like this man is legitimately probably the most accomplished wrestler to step foot in a wrestling mat at this and uh, wrestling, excuse me, at this point in history, like Hashmikov is that good, but pro wrestling was just not his thing. But, you know, it's, it's, is it surprising knowing what a Noki would do a generation later? And it says a lot about Vader and his, the, how people believed in him, how New Japan believed in him to put him in the ring with somebody who is that legit or in a pro wrestling sense, maybe he's not the most skilled or yeah, but, but the guy is, he can handle himself oh, and, yeah. uh, and Vader can handle himself. So we got an interesting match. Oh, this was a fight. It'd be really interesting. Like, because Hashmikov was a badass. So, I mean, if this was legit, it would have been kind of cool. But, yeah, as a wrestling match, it is what it is. Okay, so Choshu beat Hashimikov for the title next. And then Vader won the title from Choshu later in 1990. Uh, that was the second kind of uh, second IWGP title run. And then, we're, so we're in 1990, and we get that All Japan versus New Japan Super Show, 91, where we got... Um, Vader versus Stan Hansen. Stan Hansen representing all Japan. This is the famous uh, Vader eyeball popping out of his head match. Um, do you either of you guys have memories or uh, <laughs> images ingrained in your head about this match? I remember looking for the eye popping out <laughs> in the match. <laughs> like, I mean, you see him put his hand on his eye and push it back in, but um, and of course you see the swelling and everything. Uh, but the match is great. The match is is crazy, intense, and, um, you know, both men are – it's funny. If you watch on New Japan World, I think they do a lot of editing when it comes to the – I think there's a lot of talking going on in that match that they didn't want the, you know, people to hear. I mean, I did hear Hanson call a couple things or say, you know, just little things like, you know, like he heard a spot, so he said, okay, you know, or I got it, you know, stuff like that. But, like – you know, obviously Vader right away couldn't say he couldn't he couldn't see. I mean, that was audible, but that's but that's not anything that's exposed in the business. But um, but after that, they kind of cut this weird crowd noise between a lot of the a lot of the stuff. So I think they're kind of cutting out the communication between Stan Hansen and um, Vader because the referee was Mike. Uh, Hattori was Mike, so it caught a lot of stuff. I believe I believe he was Mike because I heard him audibly do the counts and everything. Um, but the match is great. It's intense. It's physical. And also what's kind of the sleeper that no one, like everyone remembers the I coming out match, right? It's kind of most famous, but the, the rematch in June is, is really good. Really good. I just watched that and I was like, man, I, I, I don't even remember this, this rematch as well. And I, I, sh I feel like I should, because it was equally is longer, slower paced, but still intense as well. I have a feeling that Vader really learned how to sell by working with Stan Hansen because Stan Hansen would just kind of go full blast. And mm -hmm. no matter what happens, Vader, you got to stand there. But uh, he learned how to be afraid mm -hmm. <laughs> and show it from after. No, uh, it is true that the eyeball thing outshines how good. 
I mean, it's not the greatest match in the world, but it's it's good. But it, it outshines the goodness of it, and we end up talking about that. But like you said, the rematch in June was really good, and we're going to get back to Hanson and Vader in a little bit when they meet back up in All Japan in the late 90s. But, mm-hmm. So 1990, 1991. 1991 is when uh, Vader won the title for a third time from Fujinami. Uh, I think this this was after the match that you mentioned earlier, John. This was yeah. This was more towards like Fujinami is working more with uh, WCW, and he also had that knee surgery, so he really wasn't the same wrestler that like those matches with Dynamite Kid and those early '80s junior heavyweight matches. That Tatsuya Fujinami is entirely, I think, entirely different from who we were starting to see in '91, '92, but still good, but just in a different way. So. At this time, since Fujinami has a connection with WCW, Vader, he piques interest of a lot of people in WCW and ends up there. Yeah. This is kind of where we started to see him. But he, I, I believe he initially had a deal where he wasn't just, he was doing dates in WCW, but he, he was working in New Japan as well. He was kind of, a, he had a dual contract, dual schedule. Kind of, it wasn't common, and it especially wasn't common for a wrestler to become like a reverse export he got popular overseas and came back yeah i think i think he also like i think he just you know you know just made that extra income with extra bookings with uh with wcw at the time because his bread and butter still was new japan and as those years kind of in 92 93 94 new japan wcw they kind of officially started working together like a more official um uh what's the word Kind of, it was a more official situation. It wasn't just, you know, we'll, I'll lend you uh, our talent for the show. It was more of a working relationship that we saw throughout the 90s, which really benefited Vader. So he kind of wrote on that for a little while, but he would still be back in New Japan. And But this time, since he wasn't as active in New Japan, they put him in a tag team. Big, bad, and dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Bam Bam Bigelow, Crusher Bam Bam Bigelow, who is also in New Japan. Another, arguably, he is the guy that you can say, who is the greatest big man of all time? If you said Bam Bam Bigelow, I, it's hard to argue that too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, uh, either of you guys, Bam Bam and Vader, do you have any memories of the matches or of work with most- Bam Bam Japan? The most famous one is, of course, with the Steiner brothers. When oh, yeah. They, when the Steiner brothers uh, defeated uh, Bam Bam Bigelow and Vader for the the tag team titles. Of course, uh, there's also when uh, Vader and Bigelow won the tag team titles from was it Muto, Muto and Hase, right? Yep, um, that's, that's a big a, match. That, that's a big match as well. Um, and they won the titles are, there. As a kid, when I would get the wrestling magazines and I would see teams like that, Big Van Vader, Bam Bam Bigelow, the Jurassic Powers with um, Scott Norton and uh, Hercules Hernandez. I was just like those big, like rip your head off tag teams, like just always intrigued me. You know, I mean, I, that's, I miss the ass kicking tag team. That's why probably why I don't really get into the lot of tag team wrestling now, or it's just, I miss just the big monster team that just goes straight forward and kicks your ass. I think and, the only place that that has that's going on at all right now is all Japan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I like the Violent Giants. Like, I know they're splitting up, but, you know, that that's... And also, I remember when uh, Dylan James and Joe Doring went together, like when they put them together a, a year or two ago. Like, I, I'm like, oh, I like this combination. This reminds me of those days of the 90s when it was Bam Bam and Vader and, and you know, Norton and Hernandez. So, um, yeah, I was... I couldn't wait, you know, as a tape trader later on, like I said, like there's certain things you search, I couldn't wait to see, and I couldn't wait to see the Steiner brothers versus Vader and Bigelow for the tag team title. So it's one of the things I did trade for back in the day. We'll have to talk about the Steiners in Japan too, because they had their own kind of legacy. Still, mm-hmm. people people talk about that match they had, not just the Vader and Bam Bam match, but what was it? Was Hase it Muto and Hase Sasaki. versus yeah, uh, Hase, Hase and Sasaki? That's right. Yeah. One of the Tokyo Dome shows. The people still talk about it today, like it's Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels or something craziness so okay 92 that's what he's doing in new japan but he's also popping back and forth to wcw so like he he was so popular and so important to both business to the wrestling industry at the time that he he got you could say he got two companies two huge companies to work together Mm -hmm. and they to benefit him so 
that's where he's at. And then I don't know exactly what happened with his contract with WCW. Or excuse me, not WCW, New Japan. But around like 93, he signed a UWFI deal for like eight shows. Eight shows. It was from 1993 to 1995. And he was still working with WCW. So I'm so I don't know how the initially like how the New Japan deal ended in around ninety three, but UWFI that's where he was, and he had to change his name for legal issues. So this is where he became Super Vader, which I think is a pretty cool name. And then Vader and WCW they dropped the big van. That's right, uh, and that was like by September that year, mm-hmm. and that's pretty much what we've been calling him just forever, pretty much since then. Because by the time he was in WWF, he was simply Vader. Yeah. So it's interesting that this coincides with the era where new where WCW and New Japan are on bad terms. Like I don't think we know like the details, but like the lore says that Bill Watts pissed off New Japan to the point where they didn't do business with WCW anymore. And then it took um it took Eric Bischoff a couple years to get them to kind of work together again. So it doesn't surprise me if if the majority of Vader's money at this time is coming from being WCW world champion, because that's, like I said, this all timeline-wise makes kind of sense, that he would be working with UWFI. And I'm sure that was also part of a sting for them too, you know? Huge, huge cue for UWFI. Um, and his matches, he... Guess who shows back up in his uh, career? Hashimikov, Salman Hashimikov. He defeated him in, I think it was August, in UWFI. And but I, I remember these matches. By this time, Hashimikov, I felt like he had really checked out in terms of like mm-hmm. what he thought about pro wrestling. He was just kind of like he's getting a know. check in UWFI. <laughs> he was yeah. loving. He. I read an article, an, an interview with uh, Hashimikov. He was making like some like ninety six rubles a week before. And then the wrestling thing came in and he was like, oh my God, it was totally different. Like, so he really liked the money, especially in this era. Cause you're talking like early Russian Federation stuff. So yeah, but as far as pro wrestling goes, it just, it's so foreign to those guys. So through a year and a half, two years, um, while Vader is working with WCW, he's also working with UWFI. He had some great matches with, um, Kyoshi Tamura, uh, some great stuff with Gary Albright. Uh, the big, big ones were with Nobuki Otakata. That was, as t- we were talking about tape trading, I remember that was one of the, the hot tape trade, like the expensive tape was the, the, the April, the April was at Jingu Stadium mm-hmm. where it's like 50 something, 52,000 people saw him lose the uh, EWF World Heavyweight Championship. This is 95. So even bigger, like this <laughs> one, two. So he was in the main events in Japan that were 50, 60,000 people at least three times from 89 to 95 at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he was also, wasn't he the WCW world champion who won that title too? He was, and WCW was not happy that he no. lost to Takata. In, <laughs> no, uh, no, he was not. They were not happy. Which, and you know, it's funny. I remember reading this result back in the old pro wrestling illustrated magazines and hearing about vader losing and my just you know back then you know results meant something right and i was like what is this you know what's going on and and it's like you said about tape trade this is another one i couldn't wait to see because i would read about this stuff and i would like put a mental like list to get like everything i want to see you know jerry lawler austin Idol on the cage lose jerry Lawler loses hair that was like the first thing i wanted to get for some reason and you know because i was just fascinated with the memphis and then and then you know that the stuff like this like i had to see vader and takata and just uw5 it's both matches are excellent and they're different they're different kind of vader matches where vader is really focusing on that i guess you could call it shoot or no holds barred style, whatever they called it in the nineties. Cause that style at whatever is UFC and MMA today, it wasn't fully developed yet. So Vader got in on that too. He was doing, you know, straight pro wrestling, I guess you could say with new Japan. And then he's doing a work style, work shoot style, which was just developing. And he was working with totally different stars. Takata is a very different star than Ricky Choshu and this guy is working with both of them. And it, Looking back, the more you look back, you go, wow, this guy was a freaking headliner, main event superstar. And we didn't, we, we got that sense when we were growing up watching in WCW to an extent, but at that time, 
there were no shows in the U.S. that were drawing more than 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. that, that's almost something like you can't fathom it until you see it. And I didn't really, it didn't hit me until I went to the Tokyo Dome show myself. It's just like, there are a lot of people here for Japanese pro wrestling. And you go, wow, there are a lot of people that like this. So it's kind of re refreshing or reaffirming. Because a lot of English speakers, we end up, do, we have to watch it by ourselves. Because who the hell, you have to explain, like, you have to explain what you're watching. Why are you watching Japanese pro wrestling, not let alone pro wrestling in general, you know? Yeah. But when you're yeah. in Japan, there's 30,000 people freaking out. And you go, oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, growing up, I mean, I, I, other than my friend Chad, when I was younger, after that, like no one. Yeah, I would force my little brother and make him watch. Okay, so 95, that was kind of his peak, right? That was a huge show, a Jingo Stadium show. He loses the title. He's uh, out from UWFI. <laughs> UWF, it's great uh, timing, too, because UWFI folds the next year, as we talked about a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. So Vader, great timing. Uh, this is why he chose to go to WWF. He also leaves WCW in 95 too. Oh, that's right too. Through. So it's all, it's all kind of culminates in the same, in the right around the same time. The Paul Orndor flip flop story, yeah. all that. You can find out any Vader WCW history. It's all out there. We don't need to cover that. If I, I'm, if you're listening to this, I feel like probably know already anyway. So he's in WWF, but I wanted to mention one thing when he was in WWF. The FMW, the weird FMW deal where they sent Vader and Shamrock, Ken Shamrock over to do a match on one of their cards. Um, JD and John, did you either? Do you have a chance to have watched this match? No, I have never seen this match. I just, I just watched it in preparation for this show. I went, I was trying to get all through his All Japan stuff, and I didn't get a chance to get to his All Japan stuff. I, I seen it a long time ago. I was trying, I was trying to refresh my memory, but this is one I, I think I watched once, and I totally forgot about it, and popped up on my youtube wormhole feed and i was like oh i gotta watch this and and um uh, it was pretty good you know it was really well worked no ropes in a cage um mm. vader's doing the shoot style or i guess it's technically a quote quote no holds barred match you know but um uh, i thought it was really well done shamrock came in with his ribs taped up so that was a story there they used and um did he break his nose or something or some kind of so happened yeah, there's actually a lot more to this uh, match than I I knew until I really looked into it, and I pulled some info from an old observer from '97. So around this time, there were kind of brief talks between WWF and um, not just FMW, but All Japan a little bit, Michinoku Pro, like Great Sasuke and those guys, because if you remember '96, '97, WCW, Eric Bischoff brought in the best. Uh, all, from all over the world, from Mexico, from Japan, from Europe. So I felt maybe this was a part of WWF's kind of, uh, they're trying to you know, stay in touch with what's going on in the wrestling world at the time. So they yeah, reach they, out to FMW. And they had, right? they had a triple A deal because now they're bringing, trying to bring in their own yep. luchadors for shows. That's 97 too, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The That Royal Rumble. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yep. So this was WWF's kind of, globalization period which lasted like a year or, or maybe under it but this one in particular was kind of a disaster so originally when um fmw and wwf agreed to send ken shamrock to japan for the show there was a plan for him to face like some a martial arts work like a martial arts star in a, a worked match where shamrock would win and he would get over in a front of the it was a big big outdoor show too so it looked great and the plan was to play it on raw the next day but fmw wasn't able to get this martial arts guy because he, he wouldn't fit it, um some kind of like standards or qualifications with shamrock i don't know what happened but they couldn't get him so they used vader who was going to i guess he was going there anyway but um so there was some kind of fee that w, wf was a uh, they were paying about $100,000 to WWF for both guys, for Vader and Shamrock. So they had a match. So they wanted to make it so that we're going to use an angle and show it on Raw. That was the entire idea. But something happened in the match 
because uh, Shamrock had a lung infection, actually. Mm -hmm. And the match ends with that big power bomb, yeah. and he starts coughing up blood for real. And Vader freaked out, I guess. And they didn't know exactly what was wrong because if you see somebody coughing up blood, you probably freak out. I would freak out. Yeah. But they found out because he had a lung infection, but he was selling it like a rib in injury too because it was connected to something that was on Raw the week before yeah. with Farouk. Yeah, that's what I was and, thinking. That's because there must be something they had to get to play with whatever was happening on in WWF at the time. Yeah, it was supposed to be like Shawn Michaels, Dave Boy Smith finish in that in, uh, England. Mm -hmm. Was it one night? One night, night in UK or yeah. one night only or something. Yeah. So basically that just, and because of what happened and Vader won, nothing, they couldn't use anything. Uh, it didn't work for Vader back in the United States. They didn't show it. Uh, Ken Shamrock, it didn't work for him because he got sick and it was kind of a waste of time. And that was it. Although they did talk about it the next night on Raw, they do mention this this match happened so there's that it's a interesting i don't think there's ever been a match like that or a situation with two companies like that ever um but if you want to do some more research there's a lot of interesting the tidbits on, out there the look on vader's face is you know he just just like wait i'm not supposed to win you know basically yeah i mean but he didn't really i mean i mean i could tell that's what he's 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 doing but like just, just and then he like someone that the ref must have given the iggy and like dude start start celebrating you won and also one of my favorite moments of that match is uh when vader makes his entrance he does the whole round he does the whole tour around the around the whole ringside and does you know vader time his whole entrance and vidic you know just like get in the ring <laughs> we gotta keep going <laughs> you can tell he's like you can tell he's like he's there to keep things going you know you know, we got to meet this kid's show going on, you know, so it was just pretty funny, but the match is good. I'm um, really well, really well done. And, and until that moment, I mean, not, it didn't hurt to match at all because it's a mix, you know, mixed martial arts, uh, no hope barred. So knockout finish or your, you know, uh, verbally tapping or, you know, stuff like that, you know, is works within the match. So it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to match at all. It's actually really well done. And the best part, the cage is not that well constructed. Um, so when Ken Shamrock kind of leans against the cage, it almost like bows a little bit and he kind of freaks out, and jumps back, jumps back out because he's like, wait, wait a second. You know, it's, but other than that, like the match is, it's really good. You just, uh, JD, you should definitely, it's on you, it's on YouTube and, um, you should definitely check it out. I think you're going to really, you're gonna gonna really right now. you're going to really enjoy it. I think that's fast. This whole thing is absolutely fascinating to me. I need to see this. Yeah. And in the end it, with FMW, I don't think it did much f for them. I mean, it could have, and I think, like the, like we're saying, it, it is good a match, but we're saying this in 2021 with 2021 20, eyes, mm -hmm. but back then it seemed like because of the nature of the match and because it didn't go as planned, and it was 1997, I don't think anybody in WWF side really knew how to go forward from there. And did you say that FMW paid 100 grand a piece for those guys? Uh, no, it was t together. This together. is from the, still a lot of money, man. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll read you the uh, the excerpt from this edition of these. This is Dave Meltzer in Japanese. Uh, da, 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 as a package. Oh, excuse me. Instead, they went with Vader, one of the biggest foreign attractions in Japanese wrestling history, as a package deal, believed to be one hundred thousand dollars to the WWF for both men, and again with the idea of Shamrock going over before a huge crowd to be broadcast on American television. The finish was likely changed since they had decided to book a match a rematch between the two in Japan rather than one match series. And it was felt it was better to put Vader over in the first meeting with Vader's face turn in the United States being decided after the agreement for this match was in place. This doesn't make storyline sense to air in the U S as was the original plan and isn't likely to be aired. However, the WWF acknowledged the match and its results on raw the next night. So they cut FMW a check for a hundred or FMW a hundred grand, right? Wow. That's a lot of money. That's, I just, I can't, I can't wrap my head for nothing. You know, that's astounding. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to know more of the details behind that, but I don't really know if there was, it didn't seem like there was ever a plan to go m more forward than that. I think there was something where, I don't know if it was FMW or Michinoku Pro where they sent Undertaker over for something. There, there, there was some uh, uh, back and forth between yeah. WWF and Japan during that time though. 
Yeah. Probably the last they, time it happened. Yeah, they did some stuff with uh, yeah Mitch Noku or something. Yeah, because yeah, because Taka's coming in soon, right? Like in a. Yeah, they worked with Sasuke. Yeah, Sasuke. Yeah, Sasuke, Sasuke really wanted big, those titles. He Sasuke was gonna be the big get, and then Taka Mitch Noku outshines him and and gets signed. Yeah, that was, and I think he. I don't know exactly what happened there, but I know that one part of that deal that Sasuke had was he would receive and I think he would own the WWF junior heavyweight title the old one mm -hmm. and I, th I think he still owns it I think that was a part of the deal okay. but um and you, this is a sidebar you know what I heard recently and I didn't know this was even like possible but I, and I don't know how much these guys make but a lot of the Japanese stars from the 90s that were working in WWF like Hakushi and Senjaki or Dick Togo or Men's Teo they get royalties twice a year from the network stuff wow yeah, good for them. I didn't know they got. I didn't know there was royalties in the network circle. I'm actually glad to hear that. I didn't know that either. I'm just assuming that it was probably hidden in the contract. You know, like a 200 page contract, and most people just sign it because who knows? I have no idea. But I found out that some of those guys get royalties. I'm like, wow, because nobody else gets royalties from what I heard. Mm -hmm. But somebody who should out there, if you're listening, if you want to do some research, go right ahead. I don't know what the deal is with that. That's what I heard. Okay, mm -hmm. so. So that FMW bizarre little situation aside, Vader negotiates his himself out of his contract in WWF because it's just not going great. I don't know what happened. They just booked him, uh, and he turned him into somebody he, that just wasn't Vader. He just didn't fit, right? Like, they just didn't book big monster heels like that at the time in WWF. Like, it just wasn't in their DNA. Like, they haven't begging off of Shawn Michaels. Like, I mean, it just it just wasn't a good fit. Yeah, and so so he knew what he had to do, and he went to Japan because there was more money, more respect there for him. This is right before he cut that kind of sad, pathetic promo. I'm a big fat piece of shit. Yeah, and then he was gone. But when he came back, or came back to Japan, 1998, all Japan. I mean, I would say this is Vader at his best in his entire career from from this point on into the early years of Noah. This is where he kind of showed he could be a monster, but he could also keep up with wrestlers, like the best wrestlers in the world at the time. Really, and it, like not, it, it, he didn't always have the same match. He didn't always have his monster match. He really did a he he bumped a lot more than anybody else I've seen at that size. Especially watching more and more of these matches, like he let guys slam him like nothing. Like Ricky Chosu would throw him up like nothing. I agree with you. This run, this second, this like resurrection of Vader is so good. Like it looks like he leans down a little bit from the end of his WWF career. Like, and he's, he's fantastic in 98, 99 in all Japan. Like it's, it's so surprising. Cause again, in the U S we have this idea that Vader kind of washes out with the big fat piece of shit promo. Right. And I don't think that people like, like American fans really understand that Vader really has this like reemergence and like I really kind of dug into um, the 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 triple crown match with Misawa is, is awesome. Like I I love this match, and I I saw one with Tawe he has that's really good too. Like the, there really is so much good stuff from this second act of Vader's career that's that I think really is kind of unheralded in this part of the world. I'd even say that from around that time, this is where. When he had his, I think it was maybe two or three matches with Kento Kobashi around this time. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where Kobashi turned the corner in his career. Like he was already at kind of the top, but when he had those matches with Vader, there's a draw and there was a, they, I think they traded as a, a one win a piece and a draw in Champion Carnival. But th this is where Kento Kobashi was like, okay, he's going to take over when Misawa steps down. It really felt like that. It really felt like, and he had the goatee and everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and Vader was just he, he was Vader. He he was he was a perfect foil for a babyface kind of wrestler like Kenta Kobashi. It just it was like peanut butter and jelly to me. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, you think about Vader like, coming off of that WWF run, being such a disappointment. He wasn't used correctly. You know, Shawn Michaels complained about him that he was too stiff. He was supposed to win the title at SummerSlam '96, which that got flipped. You oh. know, and what a and bummer. Of end up going to Sid and in November of 96, but you know, just, he could never get any traction. And plus I think he was, 
a little heavy. Like as re- Garrett and I are reviewing on our Raw review right now, he's still in the mix, at least in the main event scene. Um, but it doesn't last too long in 97. And, and I think you know, when, he, when he went left to All Japan, he got that motivation again, mm-hmm. you know, to really, you know, he's, hey, he doesn't want to be remembered for that WWF run. He wants to be remembered for, you know, you know, his time in New Japan and, and, and WCW where he was really successful and uh, one of the best big man. And so he really ca- captured it again. And, and of course he's obviously gets to work with God, the, you know, the four pillars, you know, who are at just her peak form, but it wasn't like they were just bouncing off him. You know, he was keeping up with them. So as, as Justin said, um, and um, it's a, it's an amazing run. I was trying to get there before we did the show, but I'm still going to, you know, post the show after, after the show, I'm still going to go and kind of dive in and rewatch those matches. Cause you know, back then, I mean, that's what makes it so much fun talking about this. I just think about the, my tape trading days and like, yep. Got to get that. I had to get his tag team with Stan Hansen when that happened for the, for the uh, World World Tag League. Like that's right. that was such a, that was a huge deal. Uh, you know, these legendary rivals, legendary match where that, you know, made our eye popping out as we, t- you know, we talked about earlier. Now they're teaming up in the carnival and what a monster badass team that one was. I mean, j- from 98 until the early couple of years in Noah, that was just unreal kind of run of so much talent in one place, but they're all being used to. And like you were saying, John, like sometimes around this time, 80s and 90s, when a foreigner would come over, it seemed sometimes like, the Japanese wrestlers had to kind of adjust their style and they had to have a certain kind of match that like, if I don't know if Hogan was there going to have a, a match with, cause Hogan's in it, we have to do this and that. But Vader was, I don't want to say like an equal, but he just, he fit right in. He didn't, he fit in, He felt like, um, it didn't feel like a special attraction, even though he's this massive 400 pound dude doing moonsaults and flipping over the guardrail and choke slamming people and like literally looking like a breaking their neck it's he he was like a video game character and he actually was kind of a video game character or inspired a ton and he this dude uh, talking about his popularity he showed up in loads and loads of video games all kind and american video games japanese video games uh he was an inspiration we were talking about zangief uh, Victor Zangief, the wrestler who was the inspiration for the Street Fighter character. Uh, there's a wrestler. If you, do you guys remember a game called Saturday Night Slam Masters? No. I didn't until you reminded me of it. And then I do remember playing that game. So this was kind of, I think it was made by Capcom as well. It's just like a pro wrestling version of Street Fighter. And there's a character named Alexander the Greater, who is supposedly based on Vader. Um, there's clearly. a game <laughs> clearly yep. based on Vader. There's World Heroes or Fatal Fury in the US, the Neo Geo. If you remember the Neo Geo arcade mm-hmm. games, there's a character named Big Bear mm-hmm. in it who he's Vader. He looks just like Vader. Uh, he was in a uh, he was in a movie in 1995. It's to the North Star. Very popular uh, older Japanese comic book manga if any manga fans out there. He was in the live action version as Goliath. And he's and, also uh, in the 96, he was in Boy Meets World. He the was. Show in, in the United States, which that's where my wife remembers him. You know, she remembers him as that, that kid's dad who was a wrestler. Ethan and, Supley's dad. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Vader, huh? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's, he's, and he also did what, Matt TV stuff too, right? Some I think he did some couple of skits with Matt TV when they were doing some stuff with uh, WWE at the time. And he, between all this time too, you know, he was getting arrested in Kuwait. <laughs> and yes, he was, and th- th- this is more like WWF and more um, WC, like American mm-hmm. related Vader stuff. So I, we could probably do an entire show about that, but I want to save that for, I'm sure other podcasts will cover that. So, but yeah, but we're 98, 99, 2000, uh, man, this was, gr- it's great, great pro wrestling, great heavyweight pro wrestling. And it's all, a lot of it's on YouTube right now as of this recording a lot of and it's pretty high definition too so and you can just type in the names in english and a lot of the stuff will show up so and so, maybe we'll, so much of that classic all japan stuff is on youtube that anybody can watch it's great yeah it's all owned by ntv nippon tv but they're not releasing like the old stuff i don't know what the deal is i think we'll never see that stuff but i don't think so. they, they don't think they care and it's all there for you on youtube so i mean like why not watch it for free you know watch it while you can yeah so there's a lot of great, he, he won the triple crown and he also won the tag titles like John was talking about, or not the tag titles, uh, world tag league with Stan Hansen. 
And so that's for 99, 98, 99, 2000 ish. Okay. Then in Japan, Giant Baba dies and all Japan, the company goes through a kind of transformation where basically Mitaro Misawa and like 90% of the roster left and created pro wrestling Noah. And they brought Vader in. He was the first, one of the first big, uh, you know, monster heels, foreign heels to come to the company. And he's, he says he's the guy who came up with the GHC acronym, Glo global heavyweight champion. That was his idea. Global honored crown. <laughs> global honored crown. I thought mine made more sense, but that is right. You're right. Thank you, JD. <laughs> But, you know, he never won a singles title there. He won a New Japan, WCW, uh, Triple Crown, All Japan, but no GHC singles title. He had Too Cold Scorpio as tag team partner there, one of my all-time favorites. And uh, he, yeah, they were the first uh, GHC tag team champions. They beat Misawa and Yoshinari Ogawa late 2001. That's right. So. It's a mind-blowing tag team to anyone that watched WCW 1993. Mm -hmm. right. that. Two Cold Scorpio and Vader. Like, I just watched the uh, Vader challenging Akiyama for the GHC title. Good match, man. And Vader's a little heavier here. He put some of the weight back on, but he's still moving really well for being that big. And it's, I think Akiyama looks great. Like, this is this is a really fun match. And it's like, it's crazy to see Vader escorted by Scorpio and, like, see them, like, high-fiving and, and, like, you know, hanging out together. It's just... It's it's it works in Japan, but I think if you try that here, you'd be like, "What? <laughs> that doesn't oh, it doesn't make sense." Their, their careers, great. Their careers are so intertwined. You yeah, know, they with, run it. Um, that's and that's why it works. They run this crazy parallel. Yeah, from New Japan, he got his boys. job. He he got his job yeah. in WCW. He got his job in. I don't know if he got his job in WWF, but you know, I'm sure. You know, there's that connection there, and I remember when Flash Funk debuted. If people remember that, you know. Oh yeah. And I was so bummed at Survivor Series '96, and Vader was the opposite uh, on the opposite team. And they when they got together, they did some stuff. Though I wonder, I questioned Vader bumping too early on uh, Flash Funk's spin wheel kick it made it look like crap. But I think he was trying to bump, make a big bump out of it. He just went a little early, and the yeah. timing was off. But overcompensated, uh, trying to take care of his buddy a little of bit. Of course, yeah. and of course, you know, but he was there to catch him on the moon salt. So, um, but you know, like. And then, of course, Noah, you know, that makes sense. And, you know, them team together, that was cool. I think that was the last, of, that was the last of the, anything major that he did, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great Noah stuff, like JD, that Akiyama, there's, I think, more than one Akiyama match that was excellent. That yeah, the, this is the two, this is when Akiyama is defending the GHC. And it's, you know, when they're really trying to make Akiyama the guy in Noah, and it doesn't doesn't quite stick but i mean like this is this looks great to me like i really enjoyed this i really enjoyed this particular match a lot here's a question for actually a question for justin do you know the history of his not his helmet but the mask because when he debuts against anoki he's wearing no mask then all of a sudden he wears the full mask oh the black mask yeah i don't know i, I vader, all, so, blew my vader mind sometimes had this again Yes, I don't know. I think I don't know if if it's this is just my speculation. This is what I'm guessing. But throughout Vader's career, he always had like these weird wardrobe malfunctions. Like he's always wearing his singlet backwards. Yeah. yeah. In Japan, that happens quite a lot too. Uh, uh, I would chalk it up to more like he forgot to put it on, maybe because I never heard anything in particular. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to wear a mask, and then I, uh, I I don't have the details on how the mask developed. But in any shoot interview that I've watched, uh, every wrestler agrees like, he never washed it. So gross. So, <laughs> but hey, that's that's the the, the jock strap mask is the the image that I have. That's that's the main one. Yeah, yeah. And he just like will take that off, like take a couple of big bumps, and he'd be like frustrated and take it off, or it just fall off, or he just pulled off mid match for the hell of it. Well, that's, yeah, that, but, I mean, that's when you shit got real when Vader took that thing <laughs> off. Like it was about strap. to turn up a level. Yeah, that's it was the, the strap exactly. Jerry Lawler <laughs> strap. Okay, I was I was just curious about that. It was like you know, debuts against Anoki, no mask under the helmet, and all of a sudden he has a full mask. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> I didn't realize uh, that. Not sure. I I have to. No man. Yeah, because he didn't. Use that. Knows that. that he could. 
Yeah, because I think Fumi was working on the TV Asahi. Like New, New Japan was doing kind of like variety, not variety show, but like a non traditional. They had wrestling, but they did like it was more like um oh like primetime variety wrestling, show? not variety show, but like, uh, like no, it was more like Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, prime like, time. They would show some matches and do some like segments, more like a Johnny Carson ish vibe, kinda. I don't know, but. It, stopped after i think 88 when kitano left but that I, I can't say because i didn't study that too much and i don't know much of the details so but so but as far as the masks i i can ask but i never heard anything do in you particular. know why he goes from the full mask to the job strap style mask like I, is there a re- i don't know the reason for the switch do you know i don't know i just assume it was pretty hot I think maybe it was after the whole eyeball thing he's oh the like, eyeball well, thing i wonder I think- if that i wondered if that's why no, because he has the full mask again in the rematch. He so. had it for a couple of years from like no, no, he takes to the, no, he, he takes the mask off in the rematch quickly. And that's when he bleeds in that match pretty good with Stan Hansen, which Hattori does the cutting for him, which I thought was, you know, Japanese referees always did the cutting. Most of them did, at least, I noticed. So if any patrons out there are listening and you know the chronology or any tidbits about the Vader masks... Help us out, because I don't know. I, I I'm I'm only thinking about him by memory, but it must have been like ninety one, ninety two when he went to WCW is when he got his his look was down more or less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so like this is pretty much we, we can taper off. This was if you're gonna watch any Vader, if you like Vader in the ring, from eighty eight to about two thousand three, two thousand four, you're you're gold. And if you look for any matches from around this time. And you're already a fan, you'll be happy. So check those out. But from after this, he, I want to say he was on a downslope. He was just getting older, surgeries. He had a heart condition, and he ended up passing away from the uh, heart, uh, congestive heart failure. So here's what's incredible about that. You just said he tapers off in 2004. He's yeah. 50, he's 50. That's right. Like you said, he started when he was 30. So he had a 20 year career that was just well, that it's unprecedented in some yeah. ways like he's still that good and like that storied of a career and he's 50 years old still like putting out those kind of that kind of performances it's crazy and yeah, like two, about 10 years ago i remember seeing him he, came, he showed up on raw i remember one time and in japan in 2011 if you guys are familiar with the march 11th the big earthquake that happened and there was a nuclear disaster or Fukushima. Yeah, yeah. So uh, All Japan Zero One did like a charity show and Vader and I believe his son also wrestled uh, on the charity show. Mm-hmm. So he was doing more shows. Like he would make appearances, but he, he wasn't working in any programs or anything. He was just, you know, that was it. He was, he could still wrestle. I remember he had a pretty uh, popular, I don't know if it was a good match, but it was a popular match with Will Ospreay yeah. about a year before he died. Mm-hmm. And right before he died, he actually wrestled in Japan. I think that might have been the last place he wrestled. Um, he wrestled for Tradition, which is Tatsumi Fujinami's company. It's this kind of like exhibition, kind of legends company where you can see a lot of older wrestlers like Fujinami show up and Chono will show up and kind of step in the ring. And you see some other freelancer indie guys, uh, Takakuno from my gym, he'll be on those shows and uh, Sayama. No, chubby Sayama these days he'll show up <laughs> but Vader showed up in 2017 Fujinami body slammed him it was earlier in the year right before he passed so um, I, I skipped around a lot towards the end because he didn't spend as much time in Japan in the aughts in 2009 to say 2017 but he showed up but his legacy is from the time we talked about today so yeah we almost um, booked him for APW really um, oh through Noah not through no 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 this, no this is later this is older this is older Vader this is um oh, my okay God like two maybe two years before he passed three years before he passed he was in contact but APW had a deal with uh, Noah early on well, right yeah what happened was um I think it was Donovan Morgan who found out so Masawa was in you know in the states with the Noah office looking for talent for Noah U.S. talent and so they. <laughs> They were coming through, they flying out of San Francisco. So Don Morgan found that out and got the office to, they had a layover, like a long time. They were going to be here. So 
they did a, you know, they got a limo for them to, to, to have Misawa and the Noah office come over. They did a tryout at our APW garage. And on this tour, apparently, they really didn't see too much. They went to, uh, they, for the summers down south, they didn't like who they saw. But then, like, they just kind of like, okay, we'll just, we'll just check this out. And they, that's where they got Michael Modest. They got uh, Don Morgan, Bison Smith, and Jardy France. He was for the junior heavyweight, but he didn't last too long because he's an idiot. But, um, but you know, that's that's how that came about. Just you know, guys taking a chance and bringing them over. Um, and then, of course, Noah did some stuff with Pro Wrestling Iron when Michael Modest split from APW and they started their own group and. They had a couple shows, and um, Masawa came to town and wrestled a couple matches in um, Hayward and uh, San Leandro, and then also um, Lathrop, a little small, small town in uh, in Central California. So, yeah, but no, this is like later on. Marcus Mack, the promoter of APW at the time, you know, still the promoter of APW, uh, was talking to Vader. He's telling me, "Hey, Vader's like the sweetest guy. He wants to. He his mother's like really sick. She lives in the Bay Area, um, so he, you know." trying to you know make some extra cash on the side you know when he comes into town and see his mother and and just never never pulled the trigger on it never happened for one reason or another and and uh so i wish we always booked him that would have been, that would have been cool if it would have worked out i know he was booked for a group called hood slam which is like a parody for wrestling company they'll get upset with me saying that but that's what they are i mean i'm familiar yeah so, california yeah yeah they I mean they do great crowds you know it's 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 a variety show basically you know they have burlesque dancers i mean capcom characters as wrestlers and all that kind of shit and they booked vader but then vader pulled out i think he saw what it was and said ah, i don't know that can be part of this crazy this and of course you know they buried him and all that stuff poor vader they're bearing vader but you know vader just you know didn't want to be associated with that i don't blame him and so that was also a funny ba- Vader Barry history wrestling history thing. I remember that happened. I was like, ah, who cares? Vader just didn't want to do it. You know, don't have to bury the guy. You know. I I gotta say, just to play devil's advocate, I mean, this is know, also he, he doesn't want to do Hood Slam, but he also went on national yeah, television and called thing. himself a big fat piece of shit. <laughs> so it's like I don't know how much worse it can get. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know, I know, but just from a, a kind of like a scale, it wasn't. It wasn't it like, that he yeah, bailed out on us. Nice that. No, just, showed up in APW. Yeah, the dates couldn't come together. I guess that's the moral of that yeah, story. it just didn't work out. Which I mean, we'd have, we we would have had to come do an autograph signing. Right. That's probably would make the most money at. Just him. didn't work out. Um, you might earn money back with him. Basically, yeah. probably do some kind of split, and then you know he would you know you know power bomb some jabron you know I mean, not jabron but some like you know lower card heel guy you know and and uh that's probably what we would do with him we wouldn't really work a full match because i don't think he'd work a match at that point but he was like i'm in shape and he's sending pictures to marcus i remember he was for marcus for me pictures of you know big van vader on the bench or this yeah you know, arms look big his chest looked pretty good but you know we just never came can the other what year was this around what so time? he passed away what 2018 2017. 2017 so i would say 2016 2015 yeah i remember yeah back then he was trying like kind of making a comeback he would kind of post a lot of selfies mm-hmm. of himself working out in the gym and he did a couple yep. of those he wanted to i think he wanted to do like some he wanted team to sun so. right his son was uh and he got in it was a chad white uh, i forget I his name was did he get developmental? I think he got a developmental deal, right? WWF, but it didn't last long, right? He yeah, he did get a developmental deal for a little bit. He he worked pretty closely with the the writer of the Vader biography, and he he ended up being pretty much in charge of the editing of that book, which I haven't checked out. But um, he I, he was very very involved with it so much so that he actually flew out to New York to discuss the details of the book with him. So he really cared about um getting his dad's book right that's what I, know. I haven't read it but i know he was very closely involved with the book so if anybody's interested i know that's available now and i guess his son is i think he runs his twitter account yeah, i believe so yeah I believe. jesse white which is his name jesse white and wrestled yeah. in, in, were, yeah, in nxt is jake carter i mean i'll reach out and see like tell him about this talk about this podcast how we talked about his dad and 
And we just he might ask know. that question about the mask. That'd be kind of cool. Actually, that all back. that yeah. kid he shows up as a little kid in the 1995 UWFI match where he beat Takata first. Not the Jingo Stadium one, but the the match before where he wins the title. The celebration in the in the ring. Mm-hmm. It's kids. I don't know. He's got to be like eight, nine years old. He's got spiky hair or something. That was his moment. The big heel. The big soft spot. But uh. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, dude, but um, he's one of my favorites in all kinds of different ways. I mean, he's kind of what's great about pro wrestling because he, he, in a lot of ways, he could do anything like in that ring, like in the ring. And it, but he, he can make people look like a million bucks because he's such a monster. And if he wanted to, like, man, those matches with Sting, you could watch those anytime. And, and those kind of transcend any like cultural parts about wrestling and that's another thing about how he wrestles because looking back on it now his stuff really translates uh, even still and not not just in the way like we were talking about uwfi but in his way the way he wrestled was perfect for his body type because he had a unique body type and he he came up Mm -hmm. with his own style of wrestling or expression in the ring in japan and he based it on who he is and he, he was a big monster and he was booked like that. And he kind of learned how to work in an exciting action packed way without, um, without like any of the fans kind of like disbelieving in him in any, you know what I mean? When he was in pain, for some reason, it, you kind of believed it, but you, you also didn't believe it because it's Vader. So it was that much more of a spectacle. And in Japan, they really kind of uh, wrung yeah. that towel dry, especially in all Japan matches. Yeah, he knew he knew how to sell. He knew how to, you know, register the pain and he knew how to, you know, he knew when to fly for the guy, right? He knew he knew he always I think he loved to do that back suplex bump. Like he loved to have the guy like reverse and hit the back suplex. Like Fujinami would do it all the time. And of course Sting, you know, would do it. But he it was built to it. It wasn't like he just give the guy it so quickly. Um he knew he knew what to do. He was such a, a smart worker and you know, I, I gotta get a lot of credit to just his time in Europe working on all those shows, like wasn't it daily? They would work shows, right? It was different like schedule, whole, yeah. Yeah, different schedule, different opponents, same same audience. So you had to wrestle different different matches each night. Eight. But lots of great wrestlers around that time. I think Fit Finley was over mm-hmm. there. St- um, Steve Wright, um, at, at probably four or five of the New Japan talent. I mean, he he was also kind of lucky to be surrounded by who are now some of the best wrestlers that we think of. In industry history and i think so too, like the way enoki put him over like cemented his oh yeah. legitimacy like with in the fans eyes like i said every time you hit that jumping power slam people would freak you know in new japan and he was just a freak talent. i mean i know people talk about his moonsaults and the vader bomb and all that stuff like which are awesome but man watching some of those old matches see him fire do that do that big drop kick out of nowhere. I was just about like, to bring that up yeah what what, dude, what you were saying like, about Inoki like that's how he first got over right but the next in my mind after watching all these matches recently the, how he got over how he cemented himself as over in New Japan was after that Ricky Choshu match where he won with he lands this drop kick out of nowhere and it's not a half ass drop kick he got some air he drop kicks the dude no, and then bounces off the rope and does a sunset flip and wins mm-hmm. one two three this dude i guess it's maybe like don leo jonathan if anybody's familiar with him he was a, yeah. a big guy who moved like or keith lee maybe like a, a big guy who's moving like so smoothly like way more smooth than you imagined but but he didn't like just do these crazy athletic spots like throughout the whole match so he he picked his spots perfectly obviious for the finish right that's when he took the air and you know to pull out the sunset flip and all that it meant something and it's memorable right you you remember that and you know now the guys will do a bunch of stuff in the match and it's all runs together but you know he's he was he was a, a super athlete and uh and he had an arsenal of like what to do and what not to do and what to hold back with in the ring. And I want to like specifically point out it, most people here are probably familiar with the star K match with Ric Flair. It's, it's one of my favorites, but th- even how, how that was booked when you fast forward, I think like a year or two later to the wrestle kingdom 96 match with Inoki, the level of violence and the level of action is totally different. And he's doing stuff that he would, he didn't have to do with the Ric mm-hmm. Flair match. Cause Ric Flair is Ric Flair. 
in the Inoki match, he was he was like Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan at SummerSlam. <laughs> he was bouncing all over the ring, fl- uh, yeah. flopping out into the crowd, bleeding. Um, so that's also something that if you're if you want to be a main event wrestler, I feel like you got to have that kind of scale. You can have any kind of main event match, yeah. and he didn't really have a choice. By the time he was in Japan, he was in the main event, and it's like you know learn get over or don't yeah, i think that was a, that was definitely a thank you to Inoki for making his career right but then he didn't have to really absolutely almost kill him with that german suplex <laughs> he, oh my god he, i don't know if that was yes. planned that way i think it just yeah. might have been a, a higher angle he he liked to uh, put some salt and pepper on those uh power moves like the choke slam and german well, suplex those know, sad thing to talk about like you know he did break someone's back you know joe thurman in 92 that was a big a big thing and um, I don't think he was reckless. I think that yeah, was just one of those things that kind of just, you know, just unfortunate that happened. Like a lot of people, like I remember the Joey Ryan tweet about bullies and there's a, there's a match with Vader on, I think it's a clip of match Vader doing the forearms in the, in the corner. And he's like, yeah, they're so glad the bullies are gone. And, and then the job guy he was wrestling wrote back like, nah, I wrestled Vader. He was fine. <laughs> Like, like it was just a work, bro. You know, like, uh, you know, I know, I know. Wrong, this is before all that wrong guy to make that but uh, it's just like you know, he if you watch him, he's he's pretty safe. Like, you know, he's physical, but like, I mean, you can see what he's doing. Like, he's 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 putting, he's hitting hard in safe places, and he's making it look harder than it actually is. You know, I mean, like he's he's a really great worker. A forearm is always, always, always going to feel better than a straight fist to the face. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'd rather see, and then it gets into like you know, your taste or our tastes about wrestling. And I, I'd much rather, see, if a guy can't throw a punch like Jerry Lawler mm-hmm. or Jeff Jarrett, just, I think, or, or do something like Don't Vader did where he was throwing these big, his arms are big yeah. and he, there's going to be contact. But I mean, now we're going to jump off into like what people think wrestling is or should be or has to be. And I feel like it, you always should go back to what would make the most sense in that moment. Mm-hmm. Like what would you do for real? Just like, I think that's the key. Just pretend like it's real always. And I feel like he, he Vader did that without compromising anything. Yeah. He just went in there, did his thing and he didn't put way too much thought into it. He was himself. You're special. Definitely. And I think that's a nice point to wrap up on. I think I hit all the points that I wanted to talk about, but if there's anybody out there uh, that we, if we didn't cover anything or you want to, you have some Vader comments or questions, you can hit me up on Twitter at Justin M Nipper, K N I P P E R. Um, so be on the lookout this week, fightgamemedia.com for JD's new stuff and his beastly Russian wrestling article. That'll be up very shortly. Uh, John, you got on some podcasts, some new podcasts recently too. Yeah, I'll be, uh, well, I'll be on the, in the click podcast with baby Huey. Um, of course I'm on the, uh, uh, fight game media network with, uh, fight game podcast with, uh, Garrett Gonzalez for the blue wire feed and also for the Patreon feed. Garrett and I are covering raw 1997, which has been a ton of fun because a lot of us, a lot of stuff I don't remember and lost us coming back to me now of course famously because everyone there 97 you just remember the montreal screw drop but so much happened leading up to that and it's been fun to rediscover all that and it's it's like the last episode we covered was one of the best hours of wrestling i've seen in a long time and you know with the chaos and bret hart starting to do his heel turn and everything and um it's a lot of fun wws really hitting all cylinders created create creativity and they're you know, building these new stars and who are going to become superstars soon. Might be the best year of the company, to be honest with you, 97. Uh, creatively, yeah, for sure. I mean, it yeah. was exploding my memory, yeah. And just to bring it back to Vader, a year later, that summer, uh, August 98, I went to a WWF house show. I saw Vader. Vader wrestled Mankind in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And that sounds a lot cooler than it. It was fine. It was just, it was a house show match for sure. First time I saw Vader um, live was, uh, was WWF show and he wrestled the undertaker, but it was just cool to see Vader come out. I was was just pop excited to see him. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That music, that Jim Johnston music. Try to throw that on. 
We'll probably close out with the Vader. Okay, let's wrap it up. I'm Justin for JD and John. We'll see you next week. <laughs>